This is my DIY VR headset. I built it entirely from cheap AliExpress parts and a whole lot of 3D printing. It runs at 2880 by 1440p and has individually adjustable IPD, interchangeable faceplates and even built-in head tracking, making it perfect for sim driving. I've made all of the files open source so you can build one for yourself, but I'll get to that later in the video. You're probably wondering why anyone would go to all this effort just to make a VR headset. Well, I've spent most of my spare time this year building parts for my sim rig and I just wanted a way to make that experience a bit more immersive. Even the entry level systems I looked at were still way too much money for me, but they also have features I don't need, like hand tracking and controllers, so I figured I could probably build something with the bare minimum features that I need for much less. I'm also beginning to suspect that I just enjoy putting myself through pain, but let's just pretend this is to save money and get stuck into the project. I don't have much experience with modern VR gear, but I do have plenty of time under an FPV headset from my drone flying days, so this won't exactly be my first head mounted display. One thing I learnt back then was the cheapest possible FPV headset was just basically a screen in a foam box with a Fresnel lens in front of it. I'd really like our solution to be more compact than that, but it is a simple idea to pull off if I can't get anything else working, so I'll keep it in the back of my mind just in case. AliExpress is absolutely flooded with cheap phone sized displays with much higher resolutions than we used to use. So doing a modern version of the screen in a box method could actually prove to be a great idea. The other option are these dual display setups that are also all over AliExpress and are actually the cause of this project because I kept seeing them and wondering if anyone was actually using them for their intended purpose. There seems to be a couple of different options in regards to size. The common ones I've found so far are 2.9 inch square and 3.81 inch square. I've also seen some round ones that are much lower resolution than the square panels, so I think we'll stick with the square ones for now. One thing we need to consider for our displays is IPD, which is the distance between your eyes. Google tells me the IPD range for most adults falls between about 45 and 80 millimeters, with the average being 63 millimeters. I'd like to make the IPD adjustable to try and suit a wider range of people, but the size of our screens is going to limit the minimum IPD. The 2.9 inch displays are a bit over 54 millimeters wide, meaning that even if we push them hard up against each other, the lowest we could get our IPD is 54 mil, meaning we'd be leaving out a handful of people with a greatly below average IPD. Even though the larger 3.8 inch panels are OLED, they would be a worse choice for this project because of the extra size which would increase our minimum IPD to almost 68mm, which based on these charts I found, would leave out a vast majority of people. So it sounds like the 2.9 inch displays are our choice. There are several refresh rate options in this size. I picked up the cheaper 90Hz model but there is also a 120Hz version for an extra 100 or so Aussie dollars, which you can pick up if you want that higher refresh rate. With our display sorted, next we're going to need some sort of lens so we can focus up close enough. My first thought was of course a Fresnel lens. You can usually get these from office supply stores or even news agents as they are sold as a magnifier sheet to magnify text for people with bad eyesight. These seem to come in a couple of different strengths with the strongest ones I've seen coming in at about five times magnification. The only one I could find locally is a three times, but it should give us the idea if it's going to be suitable or not. I've taped off a small section of my phone screen to match the size of our displays since they aren't here yet, and I'm going to measure the distance between the screen and the lens when it's in focus to see how big our box is going to be. It looks like the focal distance is about 60mm, which is going to make for a pretty deep box, so that could work if we can't find something more suitable. I thought I'd have a quick look on Ali again, just before I hit the order button on the displays, and I stumbled across these lenses, which I'm pretty sure are for the Google Cardboard VR headset. They claim a focal distance of just 45mm, which should be pretty perfect for what we need, so I think this is the way I'll go. Next up, we need to think about head tracking. The kind of head tracking we need for sim driving is pretty simple. I'm not worried about positional tracking, just roll, pitch and tilt, so we should be able to do all of that with a basic IMU sensor and an Arduino. I know that plenty of people have already done this, at least with FPV setups, so I went looking to see if I could find some software that was close to what we need, and that's when I stumbled across Relativity VR, which is an open source VR headset. They've used very similar hardware to what I've settled on, but they haven't included adjustable IPD, so at least that's something we can improve on. More importantly though, they have all the software ready to go to do exactly what I wanted with an Arduino and an IMU, and it even has Steam VR support. 
Apparently, they started this project at 15 years old, which is super impressive, so make sure you check out their project too. I've put a link in the video description. Now, all I should need to do to get head tracking working is to wire this GY9250IMU to an Arduino Pro Micro and we should be able to test it. While a PCB isn't strictly necessary for this, I think I'll design one anyway to keep my wiring as neat as possible, which brings me to the sponsor of today's video, PCBWay. If you don't have a 3D printer or just want to get this PCB made to neaten up your wiring too, PCBWay can help. PCBWay provides 3D printing, PCB fabrication and assembly, sheet metal cutting and folding, as well as CNC machining and even injection molding services. Getting parts made is very simple and there's even a September special on at the moment where you can get free purple solder mask like I've got here on my PCB. And they are also offering up to 80% off on FDM printed TPU parts, which will be handy for later in this project. Make sure you check them out at the link in the video description. My aim with this PCB was to keep everything as flat as possible, so I'm going to solder these pin headers into the bottom first and then remove the plastic space apart so I can slide both the Arduino and the IMU all the way down to the PCB. It doesn't matter that the pins are sticking out the top a bit, I just needed to get the USB-C port on the Pro Micro low enough that it can sit below the HDMI port on the display driver without interfering. With everything soldered up, all we need to do now is flash Relativity's software and give it a quick test. There's a few steps to this, but it's really not that difficult. They are well explained in the Relativity VR GitHub page, so you can head over there and follow along if you're doing this yourself. It looks like the head tracking is working nicely, so it's time to get stuck into the build. The first thing we need to do is connect the display to the lens at the correct focal distance. That's what this part that I'm calling the eye box is for. The eye boxes are printed in matte black PLA to try and minimize any reflections on the inside surface. Print them round side down with tree supports enabled. Before we fit the screen or the lens, first we need to press in three of these sintered brass bushings into both of the eye boxes. These are what the eye boxes will mount to and allow smooth movement for our IPD adjustment. Next, we need to install an M3 threaded insert into this hole in the eye box. This is also part of the IPD adjustment mechanism, but we'll get to that in a minute. Next, let's install the screens. The eye boxes have these little tabs on the back, which should allow the screen to snap into place nicely. But if you're worried about it popping out or if they just didn't print that well for you, you can also put a little bit of double-sided tape around the edges of the box to ensure the screen stays securely in place. The lens is next and you need to ensure that the larger side of the lens is facing down into the box when you install it. This would also be a good time to ensure there's absolutely no dirt or dust on the inside of the lens or the display because if there is, you'll see it. The lens should be a pretty snug fit in the box, but just to be sure it can't jump out, I've also printed this retaining cap, which you install by just lining up the tabs and twisting into place. I didn't want to use glue here because certain types of glue will ruin the lens, and this way the lenses are easily replaceable if they happen to get damaged. And that's it, the eye boxes are complete. Now we need to install them into the main body of the headset, which is this part. Make sure you print this section nose side up as otherwise you'll end up with the supports over your screw posts, which could be difficult to remove. You'll also need to install four M3 threaded inserts into each side of this part before you continue with the assembly. The first step on this part is to take two bits of three millimeter stainless rod and push them in through the open side holes like this. Don't go too far though, as we will need to thread them through the eye boxes on their way to the other side. So let's do that now. The side of the eye boxes with the threaded insert should face towards the outside of the headset. So make sure you get that right and then carefully feed the stainless rod through the inserts of both eye boxes. Use a dot of super glue in the holes on the opposite side of the box before you finally push the rods into place. These rods should be cut down to 145 millimeters in length before you start. So once they're fully pushed in, they shouldn't stick out of these holes at all. I've included a file for a hole cover that you can print and glue in now if you don't like the look of the open holes. Now, for the IPD adjustment mechanism. First, you'll need two M3 socket head style screws that are at least 20 mil in length and are all thread. Most of them at this length should be all thread, but just make sure the ones you're buying don't have a flat section towards the top as they won't work for this. First, you need to glue the thumbscrew heads to the head of the bolt. If you happen to have a bamboo printer with an AMS, I've included a 3MF file for the multicolor version of these knobs, along with a .stl for the version of the knobs with a cutout section instead of the white lettering for everyone else. 
With the knob glued in place, simply slide the bolt in through this hole and install an M3 nylock nut onto the inside of the bolt and wind it right up until it's touching the plastic. Adjust the pressure on this nut until you're happy with the feel of your IPD adjuster. With all of that done, you can then simply wind the IPD adjustment screw into the side of the iBox and you should have a complete IPD adjustment mechanism. If you find the iBoxes aren't sliding freely, you might have to adjust the bushes to ensure they are nicely in line with each other. Now, let's turn our attention to the front cover and the electronics. The first thing we need to do is put five more M3 threaded inserts into the front cover and one in this bracket. Next, we'll solder some wires to these two pads to power the HDMI driver. Since they aren't labelled, I'd recommend you check your own with a multimeter, but on mine, the square pad is positive. Now, we can slide the HDMI port into the cutout in the cover, sit the bracket on top of it like this, and then finally screw the whole lot in place. The head tracker module is next to go in, but first we need to join the other ends of the wires that we soldered to the HDMI driver onto these two holes here. This is how we're going to power the displays without the need for a second USB lead. If you aren't using the PCB, you can just solder the wires up to the appropriate pins on the Arduino and it will still work just fine. The head tracker module then bolts upside down onto these two standoffs. Last but not least, we need to use some double-sided tape to install the display splitter board onto the printed bracket. You'll have to carefully fold the large white FFC cable so that it sits neatly off to the side and that's it. Now you can just connect the displays to the board and finally install the front cover with four screws. The power and HDMI cables connect through these cutouts and should allow you to neatly route them around the side of the headset and back along the headband, which we'll get to in a moment. But first, the faceplate. I ended up deciding to use a HTC Vive facepad since they're relatively cheap and readily available. It took quite a few goes to get this faceplate to fit nicely, but I've tested this one on a few different people and they've all been pretty happy with the fit, so this is the one I'm going with. I'm sure it won't suit everyone, but hopefully if the project gets popular enough, we can make a couple different versions that will suit different face shapes. I'm using strips of self-adhesive Velcro in these rebates that will hold the face pad in place and then finally, we can just bolt the whole lot on the front. And that's it for the main headset. The only thing left to do now is the strap. I just picked up some 25mm strapping and printed these adjustable buckles in PLA. I was a bit worried they wouldn't hold, but they seem to grip the strapping nicely. You can also buy these for a few bucks, but the printed ones are good enough for me. I printed the rear plate in TPE and stopped the print halfway through to install the back strap, so I didn't need internal supports for the slot. I used a bit of tape to hold it in place while the print completed and it, it worked a treat. And that's it, time to give it a test. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how this turned out, but there are a few things that could be improved. Mainly the displays. I purposefully put the display controller facing forward so we can change between display modes and adjust the brightness. That all works well, but what I've noticed is that the displays can only achieve the 90 hertz they claim in their duplication mode, meaning if we want to run the full 2880 by 1440 resolution, which is needed for software like Steam VR to function properly, you're stuck at 60 hertz, which feels pretty choppy in VR. Unfortunately, this isn't made clear in their product description, otherwise I might have picked a different option. Overall though, I'm very happy with the design of the headset and the head tracking seems to work quite well. I did need to go through a calibration in fast IMU to stop mine from drifting, but it's as simple as opening the serial monitor in Arduino Studio with the headset plugged in and level, and answering yes when prompted to start the calibration. If there's anything you would have done differently or you just want to see me try something with it, make sure you let me know in the comments. The project is live on GitHub right now, so go and check it out if you want to build your own. Don't forget, we've also got a Discord group where you can ask questions about the projects or even just chat with like-minded people. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time.